Hi everybody, Austin from The Slight Future with a cup of coffee. The home study Q&A you're about to watch starts with Austin from The Slight Past who hasn't had his morning cup of coffee. Please forgive him for everything that he does for about the next 15 minutes and then, well, you'll catch right up to Austin with his cup of coffee ready to answer all your questions. How dogs, watch out dogs. Watch out dogs. How much money should you sell your duck eggs for? Am I worried about chronic wasting disease? What would I plant first on a small homestead if I owned a small homestead and I was going to plant something? Uh, we're gonna answer all those questions and a whole lot more in today's episode of Ask Homesteady. As many of you know, and the others of you who don't are about to find out, Ask Homesteady is our weekly Q&A show where we answer the questions that you have left on our videos from that week. If you want to get a question answered in Ask Homesteady, it's very easy. All you have to do is ask a question on any of this week's videos, and in the comments section, put the hashtag, that's a hashtag, Ask Homesteady in the comments below so that I can find your question and you have a really good chance of getting your question on this weekly show. I say really good chance and not like an absolute chance because we've gotten to the point now where in one week's time we will get like 50 or 60 questions and I would have to answer them all in with a one minute answer and anyone who's ever watched any of my videos knows I am incapable of answering a question in less than a minute. That is a superpower that my wife has, but she usually is not here for Ask Homesteady. And so you're stuck with me, which means you're stuck getting less questions than, well, not all the questions answered. So let's talk about that for a second, because I'm going to change the way we're doing our Ask Homesteady questions, how we're answering them. If you've been watching, uh, you know I've been working from the oldest questions forward, trying to catch up, and it's like running on a treadmill that you can't keep up with trying to keep up and increasing the speed as you get more tired. I'm never going to catch up. I Every week more and more questions come in and I'm never gonna catch up. So what we're going to do now for Ask Home Study on Friday, if there's a ton of noise in the side here, I have the puppies out. I'll let you see them so you can like, there they are. They're having fun, they're being cute, they're playing. It's good for that puppy to have some time to run and play out of her crate and uh, have me nearby. They are gonna add a little bit of noise to the mix. If it gets bad, I will put them away. Anyway, what we're gonna do from now on for Ask Home Study is we're going to take the videos from that week, the most recent questions that I find on Thursday or Friday whenever I film Ask Home Study for the week, and we're gonna work our way backwards. So, the most recent questions for the most recent videos will get the most attention. And if I can get to older questions, I will. But if I can't, they are so loud. Pup! If I don't get to the older questions, it's not because I didn't like them or I don't like you. It's just because we didn't have time to get to them. And I figured it'd be better to answer the questions of this week's videos. Now, if you have a question you asked two or three weeks ago and you see it hasn't made the cut, just ask it again next week on any of our videos. I'm sure it'll apply in one way or another and we'll try to get to it next week. Let's dive in, talk about things. As long as the pups are making noise, we might as well talk about them. Sierra asks, how are you working with Bones to make him less food aggressive with Poppy? We sometimes have this issue with our dogs. They're great with people, just not other dogs. Also, you are going to start doing podcasts when things calm down. We talked about podcasts last week's Ask Home Study. Go watch that one. Sierra, the, the dogs. So right now, Bones and Poppy are running around playing. They play very nicely together. The only time Bones is ever the least bit aggressive with our pup, Poppy, is when he is eating his food and that is unacceptable. Food aggression is not tolerated in this family with our dogs. We start at a very early age with our puppies, making sure they do not have food aggression. Some are more prone to it than others. I have had three labs and 
seen different degrees of natural food aggression. So first off, we talked in last week's video about how I, as a puppy, play with their ears and mess with them a little bit while they're eating, and uh, that gets them used to presence of children and people. And Bones has absolutely no food aggression when it comes to humans. But he doesn't like Poppy there. So what am I doing right now? Well for one, I'm feeding them together. Uh, oftentimes with dog training, really the key to training a dog is re a lot of, let me see, how am I gonna put this? Regular controlled sessions in reinforcing the desired behavior. So what that means is I feed the two of them together, but I am there, I am the alpha in this group, and that Bones knows I'm there, I do not tolerate food aggression, I have Bones on one side and Poppy on the other. If I see Bones getting the least bit like tense, you just monitor your dog, I'm there to control it. I'm making sure nothing bad can happen. So that means if you are training your dog anything, any kind of exposure, regular sessions, you have observed your dog many times so you can read your dog and you have the right tools to control your dog. That means you have your dog on a leash if you need to or you have your dog with an e-collar, whatever ways you reinforce the good behavior or the bad behavior. Uh, it's also good, especially as puppies, to reinforce good behavior with positive as opposed to negative, so there's that. Uh, but right now with Bones, what I'm doing is I'm sitting the two of them down, I'm feeding them together with me right there, I'm petting both of them, I'm letting Poppy eat from Bones and Bones eat from Poppy, but I'm making sure that I have absolute control over both of them, so if Bones gets the least bit tense, I can correct him, and my correction for him is very easy, just a good jag, you know, pull on the collar and a firm no, Bones does not like to disappoint me, so if he knows he's disappointing me, all it takes for him is a good no. Now Poppy is a puppy. She doesn't care, she, she is trying to disappoint me constantly, and uh, correcting her is pretty much pointless. At a puppy stage, there's very little negative. It's mostly positive and distracting. So with Poppy, if she's doing something I don't want her to do, really bad things I will use a no for, but for the most part, it's just like, oh, don't do that, here, go do this. Don't bite those children, bite this ball. We'll get to, as she gets older, more uh, reinforcing techniques. So I hope that answers your question, Sierra. We talked a ton about worms uh, the last week or so, and Alec, Alex wants to know, how do you worm chickens or ducks or geese? Any withdrawal periods for meat or eggs? We actually had a couple questions on worms. Before we talk about how to worm them, actually, let's go to the other question. Crystal Craybill wanted to know what are the signs of worms. So we'll cover both of these chicken worms briefly, and in the future we'll make a video specifically about worms for chickens. If you've been watching our worm videos, you know there is so much to know about worms. There's so many ways to uh, deal with them and work with them, so it would be a long video. But I'll just touch briefly on chickens, because we didn't talk much about treating chickens or observing signs. Oh. Healthy chickens will have worms in them. There are worm loads in all your animals to some degree. The point is you want a minimal worm load so that it doesn't affect their health negatively or their production. How do you tell if a chicken has worms? Well, look at their health and their production. Does the chicken look healthy? Is it laying lots of eggs? It's gonna have worms in it, but if it's healthy looking, healthy acting, and it's laying a bunch of eggs, you don't care. Forget about the worms, they're fine. If a chicken has a heavy worm load, you could see signs of, of an unhealthy animal, just general sickness or you know tiredness. Uh, you can look at the poops of an animal. Uh, sometimes the poops will have worms in it. You can look at pictures on the internet of worms, this is gross, right in your eggs. Imagine cracking that open on a Sunday morning and oh God, what is that? Uh, that, that doesn't make you, you know, vegan. I don't know what would. <laughs> Anyway, the point is you can find worms in the poop directly. Uh, sometimes the poops look foamy. Uh, there's lots of different signs. If you see a drop in production, that could be the reason. If you're feeding your chickens regularly and keeping them on good water and it's not winter time when the egg production naturally slows, but you're noticing like there's not a lot of eggs and there's no predators getting in, it could be worms. The best way to tell is the way we can tell if our animals have worms for sure, 
do a fecal. Take some chicken poop to the vet and say, hey, I need a fecal done. And that may cost more money than it's worth, so you could go on a routine worming schedule where in the spring and in the fall you just worm your flock. Uh, you can use some natural uh, dewormers regularly to try to keep it at bay. Uh, if your vet does a fecal and says, yep, you got a heavy worm load on these chickens, you can treat them in a lot of different ways. So again, a lot of different things. This could be a whole entire video. For example, uh, there's ivermectin porons that you actually could apply to like the back of the neck of the chicken and it would go right into the system. That's a way to treat one specific chicken. If you notice this one chicken is real sickly looking and that's why worms, okay, poron. If you want to treat the entire flock, you can dilute some into their water or dilute some into water, mix it up with their feed, as long as it doesn't make the feed go moldy. There are lots of different techniques to treating worms in chickens. There are lots of different signs to look for. That's some of them. I hope that gives both of you a little bit of a head start uh, when considering how to manage and deal with the worm issue. And like I mentioned, in the future, we'd be happy to do a video entirely on it. It'll be like two hours long and it's seriously in depth. No, we could do a longer video though and get into the more details. Let's get to the next question. Oh, I forgot, withdrawal periods. Uh, Alex wanted to know if they're withdrawal periods. So when you give any chemical wormer to your animals, they will have instructions on that specific wormer about withdrawal periods. And these are different for each dose, each uh, chemical, whatever you're doing. The purpose of the withdrawal time is to make sure that there's not a existing residue of the active ingredient in your meat or your milk products. And studies are done for each individual product, each individual uh, drug to see how long it takes to get past what they call the MRL, which is the maximum residue limit. So you look at your drug, you see how long the withdrawal time is. That ensures that that maximum level is not in your meat and that you're safe to eat your meat or your milk without worrying that you're getting a dose of ivermectin because you gave a dose of ivermectin to your animals. So read your labels, check your products. Uh, it would take a very long video to cover all of the products and all of the withdrawal times and all that. So just do your own research and if you don't want to, just ask your vet. And that's why we always suggest working alongside with a good quality vet. Keith Weed commented this week, you guys are spending a ton of money at the vets. I've said it before, if you can't afford to treat your animals and take them to the vet and care for them with professional help, then you can't afford animals. So yes, Keith, we are spending way too much money at the vet these last two weeks. But generally speaking, we spend very little money at the vet. There are just times of the year where, you know, there's a heavy worm load and you're impregnating your animals and it's just, yeah all at once. Little bit more on deworming. Courtney asked about withdrawal time in chemical wormers, um, but she did ask if we notice a difference in the flavor of the milk. Courtney, I can't answer that because we have never wormed an animal and then drank its milk right after. Again, that's usually not suggested. Uh, if an certain chemical doesn't have a period of time if it hasn't been established. The rule of thumb that I have read has been 30 days, so you at least want to wait 30 days. If we were to take Ladybug, give her a, a worming, it would be 30 days of not drinking that milk. That would be a big bummer. Fortunately, Ladybug has like no issues with worms because generally speaking, cows are more hardy to fighting worms and Ladybug has lots and lots of pasture for just her and Luna to work on. So just a little bit more as far as how long does it last. Again, each drug is different. You'll have to look at your own specific drug. We're all out of milk this morning, which I know we have a dairy cow. We should never be out of milk. I haven't had my coffee yet. So if I seem a little bit like lower energy, mmm, coffee. Speaking of coffee, Texas Boys, go check out their channel on on YouTube. Uh, Texas Boys have a homestead channel. It's a family. They live in Texas. They have a milk cow. They have a lot of other stuff going on. 
Uh, check them out because Texas boys are great. Uh, Goob wanted to know, oh these dogs, I'm putting them away. Our coffee maker. What do we use to make coffee? Once in a while you'll see it in my videos. I have a little red machine. I go cheep, boop, 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 and out comes a awesome coffee. Goob, that is a Nespresso. I actually don't know the model name. Essenza, Nespresso Essenza Goob. It's a uh, espresso machine. You put the pot in, you push the button, out comes a perfect espresso every time. I prefer a nice latte, which I have not had yet today. Uh, get a Nespresso milk frother, froth your milk, pour it on top of your espresso, and every morning, perfect cup of coffee. Just, I love it. Shouldn't talk about it right now because I haven't had it yet. So, that's their question answered. Uh, Goob also asked another question we may get to later in this episode, uh, but that's the coffee machine and go check out the Texas Boys. Oh man, coffee this morning, I know. I'll stop talking about coffee. Tony wants to know, could you remind us why you raise goats and plan on breeding ladybug? I think what Tony is saying is why do we, why are we breeding ladybug? Let me see here, Tony, what are you saying? <clears throat> Tony, we have goats because we have a ton of land management to do and goats are a tool to help with that. I wanna do a video very soon about why we have goats completely, just cover everything. But just briefly, it's for you know weed management, having another animal in the pastures is a good thing if you're rotationally grazing. And there will be a time period where we have to dry ladybug off we are planning on breeding the goats and milking them during that downtime. So we'll do the whole goat's milk thing for a short time. That is why we have goats. Ladybug, you now know when we plan on breeding ladybug because you saw it happen this week. And as far as the other animals, everybody's doing well. And uh, yeah. Ken on the run saw that our son's chicken died. He said, how did he take the news? How did you tell him? Ken, it's interesting when you raise kids on a farm, they become very so very acclimated, is that the right word? Very accustomed to death of animals. When you have a homestead, a farm, animals are dying all the time. Whether or not it's on purpose or on accident is a little bit of a different story. Uh, we have always raised meat animals, so the idea of animals dying, my kids are very familiar with this concept. Now that doesn't mean they are not affected by it. It doesn't mean that they are uh, hardened to the idea of death if one of their animals were to die, uh, but they're just exposed to it a lot more. So it's not quite as much of a tragedy as it might be to a child who does not experience that as often as our kids have. When it comes to the animals that are not killed on purpose, like when you have a chicken die from a predator or something wrong with it or a larger animal that dies that you were not planning on losing, that's sad for everybody. Uh, you are exposed to it more, so it's probably less sad than the person who loses their very first pet. The children here are farm children. And although they have their own livestock, which they really like, there are some chickens that my kids have named. Would you cut it out? Speaking of naughty pets, they're in here peeing in the barn. Don't do that. They have their chickens that are their own, and if they die, they are sad about it, but it is not a huge, overwhelming sadness. However, there are a couple chickens that have been here, well, their chickens for years now. They name, they hold, and I'm sure if something had happened to one of those chickens, it would have been a worse reaction. He, t he was disappointed, but it, that, that was the extent of it. He was disappointed that he lost one. Um, he's looking forward to the hatching of the new ones. So there's that whole circle of life thing. Uh, you know, thank you Lion King for that. My kids learned it on the farm. I learned it from Lion King. I probably cried a lot more than my kids learning about the circle of life. Mufasa, no! As far as how did I tell him, I just went upstairs and I sat down and I said, hey son, I gotta tell you something. One of your chickens died. We're not sure why. It wasn't any, you know, not a huge, huge deal. 
Most of the time, these kids are farm kids and they're used to livestock coming and going. And it doesn't, as a farmer, I think all of us kind of build up a little bit of a wall because we know when you care for a lot of animals, you're going to deal with more death. And if you allow it to hurt you the way losing one pet might, you're not going to be able to keep doing it because you're going to be overwhelmingly sad and depressed a lot of the time. I have lost pets tragically and it has very much affected me and made me very, very sad and still does when I think about what happened. However, when it comes to livestock and farm animals, I do not allow them the same amount of power over my emotions. I kind of, I think you kind of keep a wall there. These dogs. Can you two quiet down? I'm trying to do a, trying to do a YouTube video here. Next question. If something happened to my dogs, I would, I, I am devastated when something happens to my dogs. My my pet gets that place in my heart, but like my chickens don't. It just, it wouldn't work. Caden wants to know, would you ever look into raising smaller livestock like quail or rabbits? Caden wants to go real small. Chickens aren't small enough or loud enough. Caden, I would definitely, my son actually has talked about doing quail. He's interested in the idea. I'd be up for that. Maybe something to look into for next spring. We have year after year said we are interested in the idea of trying out rabbits too. I, it's just one of those, there's only so much energy, time, and attention you can give in a day, and right now we're maxed out having arrived to the new homestead, but rabbits and quail are both something that I guarantee you will see on this homestead in the future at some undesignated time. Irish YT asks a uh, first, when, if Lacey was pregnant, no, she wasn't pregnant, uh, we are going to have her bred Goats generally come into their cycle in the fall, so we will be doing goat breeding in the fall. We're going to be breeding her with a buck right over the hill. The uh, goat herd over the hill, Kay's aunt's goats. There's some nice bucks there that are not related that we could breed her to, so that'll be good. And the other goat, who you don't know the name of because we haven't announced it yet on the channel, but we'll do that next week. We finally picked a name for our other goat. She also will be bred, but at a later date because she is younger and smaller, so she might miss out on this year. We'll have to see. However, also Irish asks, have we used or will we use sexed semen when we breed ladybugs? So no, we did not use sexed semen. It's an awesome idea. It'd be great to be able to just say, I want a heifer. However, the sex semen, the semen we decided to buy for Ladybug was not available in sexed. Just wasn't an option. And there were a ton of questions about the bull we chose, how we chose it, why. We'll do a video next week about uh, Ladybug's baby daddy and how we picked him. So all your questions, I didn't miss them. We'll just get to those next week because that deserves its own video where we'll talk about the daddy. I'm going to go have coffee right now. I think it will seriously help this Q&A. If you stuck around this long through my cranky, tired morning Q&A, congratulations. I'm going to play an ad to add insult to injury, and after that ad, I'll be back having had coffee and able to finish this properly. Okay, watch the ad. I'm going to have coffee. We'll see you in a minute. Back. Mm. Now I'm ready. Do this. Man, that morning cup of coffee. Kay wants to know, are you going to do any new videos on hydroponic gardening? Good question, Kay. Maybe. Um, gardening is not my thing. Over seven years of homesteading, I have learned that every year I will do like a bunch of gardening stuff right up front and then I'll just lose interest with it because it's just like plants, I don't know, they're not as exciting as a furry little animal that lays an egg or you know a bunch of flocking animals that then you know have babies and make food and 
I just like livestock and I like being outside, you know, uh, on the mountain looking for, you know, hunting or foraging and fishing. That element of homesteading is my favorite. And so gardening always takes a backseat to that. Now, in our new place, when we move into the big house, there will be this beautiful sunroom, which would be a perfect spot to have a nice little kitchen garden. Uh, and right outside there are some raised beds. So there's there's already great infrastructure for a little bit of gardening. So we'll have to do a little bit just because, I mean, come on, it's right there. But hydroponic, I'm not sure. My little dabble into aquaponics last year, there was a lot of parts to it that I didn't really love. You had to test the water. And I know like people who get good at it don't really have to worry about that stuff quite as much. So I, I, I might try it again. I got to see. It's one of those things. It's incredibly... Uh, it, it yields so much. If you're into it, it's awesome. I was fascinated by it, but I'm not as into it as I am like having six pigs out in the back turning garbage into bacon. And when I say garbage, I mean like apple cores. I don't actually feed my pigs garbage. Come on, you know me better than that. Pat Booty. Booty? Booty. If you had your own delivery truck, couldn't you still deliver chicken meat to your stores? Good question, Pat. Selling chicken meat is one of those things that there's usually a lot of regulations around, uh, depending on how you raise them, where you have them butchered, and a lot of times having a refrigerated truck is part of that regulation thing. So you would have to have some sort of refrigeration. Depends on your state. I don't have any interest in selling meat chickens other than just a little bit of surplus to friends and family here. I don't have here at the new farm as much interest in selling meat, period, because my local market is very strong. There's a lot of producers, a lot of good quality stuff and at lower rates than what we did in Connecticut. And it just, for me, I don't like doing the same amount of work for less money and I know I know what I'm getting into here. So I'm much more interested in probably selling breeding stock. I think the, the business plan I have for this farm will be selling homestead breed stock, great quality family milk cows. If anyone wants to get on that waiting list, we better put one together because as you all know, Ladybug's gonna have a, hopefully a heifer. That's, that's the big game you're playing there. Of course, we'll be breeding Luna. I'd like to grow that side of this business as well as our goats and uh, you know, just, We've spent years looking for good lines and getting really an understanding of what a good homesteading livestock is. And I would like to just keep breeding livestock for homesteaders to have as their own stock that I can certify, you know, the homesteady star of approval. This stuff is awesome. As opposed to whatever, you know, Russian roulette you're gonna play on Craigslist. We still haven't come up with a, a winning term as to what to call livestock roulette, but anyway. Yeah, so that's more of where I'm headed with my business model. Tyru wanted, no, Tiru. Super fan, Tiru. Let me know that I am pronouncing his name wrong. Guys, never feel bad to let me know how to pronounce your name, especially if you comment like all the time and I'm saying it wrong, like I was with Tyru. Tiru is a combination of T-Rex and kangaroo, Tiru. But Tyru would be Tyrannosaurus. Anyway, it's your nickname, I'm not gonna tell you how to say it. Tiru wants to know, does the Amsteady link work for Amsteady.Canada? Good question. So as many of you know, if you want to support our channel, do all your Amazon shopping through Amsteady.com. It will forward you on to Amazon. Anything you buy will get a little bit of an affiliate bonus from. And if you love our show and you want us to keep doing this, it is a zilch pain way to help support us. It doesn't cost you a penny extra. Puppy's trying to get at my coffee. Uh, but it does really help us. So even if you could adjust some of your shopping practices, like if you don't get toilet paper on Amazon, maybe start ordering your toilet paper through Amazon, save you some gas money, it'll be delivered for free if you have Amazon Prime, which you should, because the less money you have to waste in gas, you know, free two day delivery. I mean, I have Amazon Prime, guys, it's great. Anyway, whatever you could buy through Amazon, through the Amsteady link first would be a huge help to us. Tiru, it does not yet work for .Canada or UK or any of the others. However, I am going to set that up. I looked into it today, it's not too hard. I got the ball rolling because you guys want to support us from other countries. I super appreciate that, so I'm gonna make it work. So, 
coming update on that. Soon you'll be able to shop through the dot CA or dot UK or whatever other Amazons you normally shop with. And thank you to all our Amsteady supporters. If you could just make yourself a note before you do Amazon, Amsteady. It is a huge way we were able to do this channel. It has been very helpful. So thank you so much. We really, really are genuinely thank you for that. Thankful for that, not thank you for that, both. Donna wants to know how much are duck eggs going for? I've got 10 dozen fresh eggs and several double yolkers to sell to someone who wants to buy some, but I have no idea what duck eggs sell for. Donna, this is a great question because you're gonna be unhappy with my answer? <laughs> no, because the answer is, uh, it's gonna, it's not what you're hoping for. I can't tell you like, Donna, sell your duck eggs for $7 a dozen, duh. There is no like flat going rate across the world and I don't know where you live, Donna, you didn't tell me. If you live 10 minutes from me, I could give you a good idea. If you live an hour from me, I could give you a good idea, but I have no idea where you live. So, here's what you have to do, and it's not too hard. You have to go to your farmer's market. Where's the nearest farmer's market? Find somebody selling duck eggs. Take note of their price. Oh, that person's asking $8 a dozen. Now, take a look at it in perspective compared to chicken eggs. Duck eggs are always more expensive because they're usually a little bit bigger and they're just a hot commodity. There's less people raising ducks. There's less competition. And there's where the other element comes in. So if they're selling them for eight and another guy's selling them for seven and then another guy's selling them for six, you gotta figure out where in that circle uh, you wanna put yourself. Are you selling premium duck eggs? They're fed the best quality and uh, each egg, what do you call those? Carton, each egg carton comes with like a little Polaroid picture inside of the duck who laid them and it's an experience, you know, the quack of the month. Then your premium and maybe you could even ask like $10 a dozen because hey, they're premium and maybe there's less of them. Or do you have like a huge duck farm and you're like spitting out double yokers, pa pow, pa pow, and you just want to move these things and if you move a bunch of them, you can make money off a smaller margin. Then you could charge $5 a dozen for them. But most importantly, cover your expenses. So even if everyone around you is selling duck eggs for $5 a dozen, if your feed and your you know, heat lamps for your brooders and your water from the city and the barn you use or coop you had to build, all that expense needs to be factored in. Some expenses are direct. You buy a bag of feed, it's $10, that's $10 for this many eggs, and you can figure that out exactly. Others you have to amortize the cost of. If you bought a chicken coop for $1,000, and you figure it's probably gonna last you 10, maybe 15 years, well, if it lasts you 10 years, that's easier on the math. $1,000, 10 years, $100 a year has to be covered in the cost of the eggs. How many eggs are you gonna get this season? It's not too hard to get an estimate of that. Add that $100 figure to every carton of eggs you sell. That's how you amortize out your cost. If you're not factoring in that cost, you are giving away your profit because let's be honest, most profit margins, especially on a farm, are very small. On a good year, I would profit off of my pigs back home a 30% profit, and that was really good. If I could get 30%, I was happy. So 30%, if I had not factored in the cost of my barn, well, over 10 years, I gotta buy a new, fix up my barn, build a new barn, or, sorry, coop is what we were talking about. If my coop is gonna degrade after 10 years, we're gonna have to buy a new one. Yeah, I take all that profit, and at the end of 10 years, I then use it to buy a new coop. That's zero profit. You can't afford to do that. Even if it's, if it's just a total hobby and you just want to move a couple eggs, that's one thing. Go for it. Have fun. But if you're trying to make this an okay, even pay for itself business, you have to factor in everything, amortize the cost of all your infrastructure, and even then you're going to forget stuff, which is why I shoot for a 30% profit off of any of my farming enterprises because I'm more likely to actually be putting like 20 in my pocket because I'm not really good with math, as all of you know if you watched anything I did with Accountant Mike ever. 
So factor all that in, Donna, and you should be able to come up with a totally fair number. And I find it always helps if you have friends or family who want to buy eggs and you don't know how much they cost you to produce, you kind of feel bad asking top dollar for them. Oh, you know, you want to ask $8 a dozen, but you feel bad because it's like your buddy and you're like, mm. When you factor out how much it's costing you and you realize that producing those eggs cost you $7 a dozen, and for the time you spend on that, you're gonna give yourself $1 per dozen actual profit, you won't feel bad at all saying, yep, they're $8 a dozen. When people say, whoa, $8, you can say, yeah, because my feed cost me this, my building cost me that, my water bill every month is this, my electric bill to brood the babies is this, and when you do all the math, you find it comes to $7 a dozen, and I figure it's fair to ask for one extra dollar for my hard work. Next question. Ooh, the sun is so bright I can't see my computer screen. Barbara has a... Puppies. I love dogs. I'm not a huge fan of puppies. Puppies are a great dog in the making. Puppies. Let's do a little dog training while we work. Fly spray. I think the natural one. Yeah, the natural one. If the puppy barks, I'm gonna spray her. Hopefully that teaches her not to bark at me while she's in her crate. Let's go to the next question. Barbara wants to know, she says, I love deer meat, but I'm afraid to eat it now. I've heard about chronic wasting disease. Do you plan to have any deer you kill tested for the disease before consumption? Good question, Barbara. I do not plan, I don't, so if you don't know what chronic wasting disease is, uh, for anyone out there who hunts, deer can get a, a disease called chronic wasting disease. What does it do? Well, let me tell you. Okay, here's what chronic wasting disease does. I figured I'd just read it to you, it's easier that way. Um, it's progressive, it's always fatal, inhibited movement starts, weight loss, listlessness, uh, lowering of head, tremors, repetitive walking and set patterns, nervousness, uh, excessive salivation, grinding of teeth. This is something that is observed in deer. And studies are being done on it to see if it's in any way transmissible, transmissible to humans. Um, there's, you know, the jury's still out on that. Here's the thing, chronic wasting disease, it's located in the brain and in the spine. I don't eat deer brain, I don't eat deer spine. I also don't cut through the spine or brain when I'm butchering my deer. So there's no way I'm coming in contact with this disease. Should I even shoot a deer with this disease, which this disease is in wild herds, it is rare. In like deer in confinement, it spreads more quickly. And yes, wild deer can get chronic wasting disease. Uh, further down the line, chronic wasting disease uh, looks pretty bad. You can see, you can tell visibly that the deer has this, this disease. So I would not shoot a deer that looked unhealthy or sickly and then eat it. Um, the only reason to shoot a sickly, unhealthy deer is to put it out of its misery. If you saw a deer that was very sickly and unhealthy, I'm gonna get it ready. Um, so I am not concerned about getting it from the deer that I eat. I'm not concerned that it's going to be transmitted to me. I've been eating venison for almost 10 years now and uh, it's just not a big concern. Don't cut through the spine or the brain. If you're doing deer, ch I would avoid doing deer chops on the bone. I would just debone the whole loin and you should be good to go. So Barbara, that's that's all there is to chronic wasting disease here at home study. Part of training a dog I have found is instead of taking like time out of your day to do the dog training, which I mean you have to do a little bit of that, especially if you want a bird dog, uh, but just general manners is making yourself train them while you do other stuff. So here I am doing a video. I do not want the dog to bark at me while she's in a crate. So a little bit of just water spray to make her go like, oh, I shouldn't do that is a nice way to tell her to cut this out. And uh, uh, so much of dog training I do just while I'm doing other stuff. When you're feeding the chickens, have your dog on a leash with you while you're feeding the chickens. And when that little puppy goes to nip a chicken, you jerk that leash and you say no. And that 
enough times that dog will just learn. I don't go for those chickens. And for 90% of the dogs, if you do that as a puppy, you're not gonna have a problem with chickens ever. You won't have to use any kind of negative reinforcement beyond just that no and that tug on the leash. Here I'm just spraying her with a little bit of, you know, peppermint, essentially, and, or I don't know if it's peppermint, whatever Kay put in that thing. It's a livestock spray, so it's safe for the dog. But, um, yeah, she's not barking at me anymore because she doesn't want to get sprayed with that mist. So if you're training a puppy, just take him with you and constantly be training. That's the best way to train a dog. Nobody asked, Aust. No one cares how you train your dog. Okay, next question. <laughs> Marilyn wants to know, do you groom your eyebrows? They are a beautiful shape. Marilyn, thank you very much. They are kind of a nice shape, aren't they? <laughs> yes, I totally do, Marilyn. Now, I'm not like, I don't go down to the salon and like get my eyebrows done. However, I have some, you know, thick Italian blood and uh, I'm a, what you might call, hairy individual. I had by like grade eight a solid unibrow, just poof, you know, furry caterpillar, winter is gonna be three more months, I don't remember, what did the caterpillars tell you about the climate? Anyway, boom, right across the top, woolly bugger. And I was not interested in being the guy with the unibrow, so I decided, you know what, I'm gonna have to weed whack this bad boy. As you know, I take pasture management very seriously and that includes the growth right in between the thing there. I'm not rocking a unibrow. I gave that up in eighth grade and I haven't looked back. So a little bit of maintenance just to make sure I don't have a solid unibrow and be the guy with the YouTube channel about homesteading who looks like Sasquatch, you know. I'm not afraid to admit that I do have a pluck session from time to time. As far as the shape goes, I don't know. I haven't really paid attention. I just, I just trimmed the middle. Anyway, enough about my eyebrows. Let's go on to the next question. Hot in the shade, Homestead. She's just laughing. Texas Boys. Told you the Texas Boys had a question about my camera gear that I'm using to film this right now. Uh, what type of camera gear have you been using in the new videos? And also, what type of thumbnail editor do you use to make the thumbnails for your videos? And can you do a drone review video? Goober wants to know. Again, check out Texas Boy's channel. Goob, for my camera, I use a Canon camera. I use the 80D, it's my workhorse. I have a couple different lenses. I have the one I'm shooting on right now is a wide angle lens. It's the Canon zoom lens EF-S 10 to 18 millimeter. So you get that really wide angle but then you can also zoom in and get that tight shot. I like to have two different shots. I use almost 100% zoom lenses for vlogging, if you know about lenses for cameras. If you don't care about this, skip like two minutes ahead, we'll get through it. Um, this lens, it can zoom. There are lenses called prime lenses, which are fixed. They don't zoom at all, and you have to run back and forward. And I find with home studying, it's always good to have a zoom lens. Now, zoom lenses typically don't have as nice of a picture quality as a prime lens unless you buy a fast lens. And the best fast zoom lens is my Tamron 24-70. It's a great lens out there, and it's the one that I use. And if you click on the gear link below, it'll take you to our website where it lists all my gear, and I have a whole section on camera gear, so you can buy through any of those links. Help support us. You can buy through Am Steady, any of the equipment, the Tamron. 2470 is a great lens and I really suggest that one if you want nice cinematic. All my really pretty footage is done on that lens for the most part. I also have a telephoto which was ridiculously cheap, Canon. Uh, it's like a 70 to 200 great quality footage for like 200 bucks. It was, it was ridiculously cheap. A lot of this stuff is very expensive. The Tamron lens is a $1,400 lens. Not cheap. When I ask you guys to help support the channel through Amsteady or whatever, it's because this equipment is so expensive. I have probably $10,000 worth of gear to produce this channel, and it will all break in three years, and I'll have to replace it. Talk about amortizer cost over the lifetime of, its, of it. So, anyway, um, Canon, those lenses. I use a Mac computer to edit my video. 
I have the Mavic Air drone, and I love that drone, and it'd be cool to do a drone review in the future, because homesteaders can use drones, even if they don't have a YouTube channel, it's nice to be able to get diff that look at your property, you could over the years take nice above shots and see how you're changing the place, and learn about animal movements and things. It's a cool tool to have, it's not necessary, but it's fun. If you want an excuse, if you guys want an excuse to like tell your mate, who doesn't want you to spend a thousand dollars on a drone that you need a drone, you can say Austin from Homestead, he said it's a really good homesteading tool that would be nice to use on your homestead for pasture management. There you go. And Goob, I don't know if, who buys you guys camera gear, but you know, go over to dad and be like, dad, we really need the Mavic for pasture management. Aust from Homestead, he said so. Or don't even say that, just say like, I saw it in a professional homesteader video. <laughs> Couldn't even keep a straight face, straight face when I said professional homesteader. That's not a real thing. This is a great question. Not that the other questions weren't great. I just like this one. Kelly wants to know if you were starting with a small half acre suburban homestead that only allows chickens and rabbits for livestock, but no restrictions on plantings of any kind, what would you put in first thing this fall? She says get a few fruit trees and berry bushes in the ground, even if we don't have a master plan yet. My husband says until the fall, uh, use fall and winter to observe and plan and then start the process of constructing and planting in the spring 2019. Any opinions? Of course I have opinions, Kelly. I love sharing my opinions. That's why I made a YouTube channel. All right, let's get into this, Kelly. This is a good question. You can plant anything. What should you do? You know here at Home Study, I am a big fan of taking your time. Get to know your property. Don't rush into things. Don't show up and get cows and an orchard and all the chickens you can possibly find on Craigslist. Learn your property. If you're starting with this small homestead, if you just moved there and you don't really know the place, take it easy, okay? Now, I know when you move on to a property and you've been waiting to start homesteading, you just can't wait. I understand that, I've been there. So that doesn't mean don't do anything. What it does mean is don't plant an orchard. Do not this fall plant an orchard because I guarantee you, you will plant it in the wrong place. You will not think about sun or flooding or just where you want it in your overall theme. You don't have any idea of how you're gonna use this place yet. Where's the chicken coop gonna go or the rabbit hutch? So don't plant an orchard. That's way too big of an investment of time, of money, and if you do it wrong, you're gonna be kicking yourself. At Squash Hollow, I did a garden in the wrong place, I did an orchard in the wrong place, I did li I did everything wrong because I just didn't plan and didn't think. Your husband is right, take some time, plan, master plan, design it four different ways, you know, slow. But I understand you wanna start plants of some kind because they take a long time, the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. No, it was 10 years ago, the second best time is today. You wanna get some trees in the ground. So here's what I suggest that you do. Trees and bushes. There's going to be a few spots on your property where you're definitely not gonna put livestock. Maybe it's by your house, uh, maybe by a patio. It's just you're not gonna want the smell of animals or the noise. Where fruit dropping also won't be an issue. So remember when fruit drops, bees come and you got swarm. You don't really want that by like your deck or where your kids are gonna play. So think hard, you know, take a little time, really think hard, where can we put a couple fruit trees? Uh, maybe you have a pathway that you walk in every day and a little bit off to the side of that path. You could have a tree and it wouldn't drop fruit on the path, you wouldn't have to deal with the bees right there and it'd be in an okay spot. Plant two, maybe three, because they'll do better, you know, if they can cross-pollinate, three of your favorite fruit trees in one spot. Just, uh, you know what, back at Squash Hollow, we did it on the path going up to the house. There were never gonna be livestock there. Uh, we didn't, where we put them wasn't so close to the path that bees would be a problem. It just made sense. It's, no matter what we did, that was an okay spot to have fruit trees. They, uh, so we put those three in the ground the first year before planting our orchard, which is a much bigger time and money investment. So get a couple fruit trees in the ground, just a couple. Also, bushes, 
You can put blueberry bushes in pots. A lot of people say blueberry bushes do better in pots than they would ever do in your soil unless you have very alkaline soil. So plant a couple blueberry bushes in pots. Uh, you can trellis strawberries. So build yourself a little strawberry trellis. Here, year one, you'll have three nice fruit trees. Do dwarf trees because they have a shorter lifespan and if you decide you did make a mistake, well, they're gonna die sooner than like a giant apple tree will. A couple dwarf fruit trees, a couple blueberry bushes, a strawberry trellis, which your friends are all gonna be super jealous of. I mean, that right there is enough of a project from now till December. That'll keep you busy, that'll keep you happy. Meanwhile, your husband, who's sitting there with his master plan, designing and orchestrating the perfect half-acre suburban homestead, which he'll later write a book, how to design the perfect half-acre suburban homestead. Uh, he'll have time to do that, and then he'll tell you, okay, the perfect spot for the apple orchard is here. And, newsflash, even then it'll probably be wrong. You really don't have a good idea what you're gonna do with the property for probably five years, but you'll be in a much better place if you take the winter. Honestly, I always suggest you take an entire season before you do something really big like an orchard because you just gotta learn your property. But do a little something, a couple fruit trees, a couple bushes, a little trellis, you'll be super excited to have that fresh fruit and it'll tide you over. And all the other stuff you can't plant at your own place, find a U-Pick farm nearby to support. They're great and um, you'll have tons of extra produce that you can can and make yummy jams out of and it's just fun. Awesome question, Kelly. Thank you for that question. Next question. Jenna wants to know, will you ever get into horses? Your property looks like it would work for them. It would. Okay, had a horse here and it worked for the horse. Will we ever get them? I am not big on the idea of getting horses, but I have children and someday one of my children are gonna come to me and say, Daddy, I want a horse. And I'm gonna say, no, like every dad whose child asks him for a horse. And then they're gonna ask me again and I'm gonna be like, well, you know, we can talk about it, but you need to do your chores. And then they're gonna be like, Daddy, can I have a horse? You know, everyone else does this plays out. So yeah, Jenna, stay tuned. Chelsea from Australia, they have a 140 acre homestead. That's beautiful, with a Labrador. Like my two sleeping pups, they're sleeping now. And no more barking in the crate. <laughs> She also wants to know, have we ever considered aquaponics to get fresh fish on your family's table as well? Chelsea, here's the thing. If I want fresh fish on my family's table, I way more enjoy going fishing than I do like checking the pH levels in the tank and making sure that, you know, the fish are healthy and the nitrate levels aren't killing them. Somebody's gonna correct me on the word nitrate and say it should be nitrite or something. Anyway. Aquaponics um, is not as much fun as fishing. I'd much rather go fishing. So I never will do aquaponics with the goal of the fresh fish on the table. I'm not a big fan of tilapia as it is. I do and I did, if you look back in our video's history, you'll see I played around with aquaponics a little bit at our old place. I do like the idea of aquaponics, mostly for the, the plant side of things. Um, and as far as what fish I would use in the system, I always like the idea of using bait fish because I like going fishing with bait fish. I'd have my own really healthy supply of bait fish that I could draw from when I need them. And then if something were to happen where I wasn't great with managing the fish and there were to be some fish that died, it would be small bait fish and not like big large tilapia where losing them would be a critical issue. Because knowing me, I would lose some fish because I'm not like, yeah, the water testing thing, it was not my favorite thing to do. So. Maybe in the future, as I mentioned with the hydroponics, maybe we'll get back into it again. That's yet to be decided. But for fresh fish, my favorite thing is to go crappie fishing. I don't think there's a better freshwater fish out there than a nice crappie filet. And saltwater fish, I love a good striped bass. And I do those two fishings every year and they keep me happy and enjoying the fresh fish. Kyprian says, why didn't you add some geese to your flock? We had geese one time, and this was way back when we first started homesteading, and we lost them to predators because we were really bad noobs, and uh, we got pwned. So, why don't we do it now? Well, just, we haven't 
barely thought about geese. They're good, good for uh, predator. They keep away some predators. Obviously, they don't keep away all predators because they died. <laughs> that was mean. But uh, maybe one of these days we'll get some geese. This is a good question. We've been talking a lot about dogs because of the fact that I just picked up Poppy. Uh, Jess wants to know my opinion on mixed breeds on a farm. She has a mutt dog. She's horrible with birds. She tried trainers and everything, but she is a chicken killer. I refuse to give up on her. She does good with farm life. She loves to hunt rodents. That's a good trait to have on a farm, uh, but you gotta keep the chickens away. So this is good. Jess, talking about dogs, and nothing gets people riled up more than talking about like dogs, so I'm sure people are gonna argue with me in the comments below, but that's okay. It's what you do with YouTube channel. Dogs breed. The reason you have purebred breeds that for people have for centuries continue doing, or at least decades, I don't know about centuries, but the reason people like actually try to protect lines and keep them pure and keep them reg or good breeding stock is so there is a level of reliability. Livestock, and I'll throw dogs in there on a farm as livestock, are a huge time and money investment. Even if you get a free one on Craigslist or you save, you know, from, a, a um, shelter where they're gonna kill the dogs after a week or something. Even if you adopt and rescue a dog, they still are gonna cost you money. There's an adoption fee and then you gotta feed the dog and you know take it to the vet when it's sick and you gotta buy the dog a doggy sweater so he doesn't get cold and you gotta buy him a doggy stroller and you gotta buy him your doggy seat belt and you gotta get that fur baby a doggy diaper. I'm kidding with all those things, obviously. Unless you wanna do all that stuff, then by all means. The point is, all dogs are gonna cost you a bunch of money and a bunch of time. And if you're gonna invest that much in a dog, I think it's really good to know what you're getting into. I'm gonna spend two years training Poppy, like, actively and then the rest of her life maintaining that training. I've already spent a bunch of money on her, the vet, you know, the shots, taking care of the diarrhea, the feeding, all that stuff, the equipment to keep a dog. I wanna know that when she's grown up, she is going to do good with my livestock on my farm. She's gonna be obedient. She's gonna be good in the field for hunting and tracking. If I buy a mutt, there is no way to like t have a guesstimate that, of what she'll be able to do. If I don't know her parents, I don't know what for you know 10 decades these dogs have been doing this job and they're really good at it. A mutt, you're not gonna know what you're gonna get. Now you might know, well the father was a lab and the, I think you actually mentioned her mother was a German shepherd, the dad is unknown. Well here you go. A German shepherd, a shepherd dog generally is going to want to shepherd a flock. Now, shepherding often involves like kind of nipping towards the animal. If you watch a German Shepherd, they're always nipping because they're trying to shepherd. They're like, oh, I'm gonna give you a little bite there to send you back where you're supposed to be. The German Shepherd on this property is constantly nipping. Uh, he also likes to nip chickens and when you nip chickens and you're a German Shepherd, that's called killing. And it's, it's not okay. We don't, we don't allow our dogs to do that. If you have a mutt, you're not gonna know what to expect. And if you want to play livestock roulette, come on guys, let's please get a better term for that. And f hope that your mutt is gonna be okay with your animals and also a good fit for your farm. I don't wanna do that. I wanna know reliably. I know labs from the line that I got, these labs, they're good, easy to train. They're smart, good genetics. Not all labs are, you gotta pick the right line. Uh, they're gonna have good noses for tracking and hunting. They're gonna have soft mouths, so they're not gonna ruin the birds they recover. Even if they were to go for a chicken, they have a soft mouth, so they shouldn't kill that chicken. However, I, they also need training. So this is where your mutt might be okay. A lot of people watching are gonna say in the comments below, I have a mutt and it's great around livestock and it's never killed anything. Well, that's probably because it happens to have some good genetics and you did your work on training it. And these dogs, if I just let them run amok, they would kill chickens, but I take the time to train them. So I, I guess the right way to answer this, 
I think I'm, I often use cars as an illustration for dogs. If I am going to commute two hours a day into the city on state highways, if I was working in Pittsburgh and I was taking the state highway every day to my office job and I was driving back and forth, my I would want a car that had good gas mileage. I wouldn't care so much about, you know, four wheel drive because if it snows, I can not hit the road. I can just tell my boss I don't want to drive. Uh, I'm not buying a, a thing to go four wheeling in. I would buy that kind of car for that purpose. Now, uh, that's not me. I, I have a giant van. I have four children. I'm always transferring dogs and livestock. So I bought a giant van so I could fit all that. If I wanted to go four wheeling with my buddies, I'd have like a Jeep. So you, you, you buy a car based off what you want it to do. You probably wouldn't go to the car dealer and say, oh, you know, give me whatever and we'll hope it works for me. That's how I suggest you get dogs. You figure out what you want the dog to be able to do good at. They can't be good at everything. A dog that's good at one thing, like killing rodents, will probably not be good around your chickens. But rodent control is an awesome thing for a dog on a farm. So figure out what you want, and then I suggest finding a good breeder, and I suggest avoiding mixes. Now, if your dog is your primary thing, if, you're not, if you don't have a bunch of livestock, or if you're willing to say, well, I can fence in the chickens and keep my dog separate, and you like adopting dogs because you don't want them killed, well that's awesome because it's sad to see dogs killed at a kill shelter. And if you want to rescue some dogs because it's dog first home, go for it. But if you're a farm and you got livestock and they are a priority and your dog has to work into that bigger picture, good boutique breeder, good line, a dog that you can know like 90% sure before you spend a dollar or an hour with them is going to be able to handle life on that farm for that purpose. And if you're looking for that, a good line of Labrador Retriever is the perfect farm dog if you have a homestead like us. Not for herding. If, you, if you're herding sheep, I wouldn't use a lab. I would use a sheep dog, but yeah. Okay, I love talking about dogs. We've been talking about dogs a lot lately. The Great Farm Life wants to know what do you feed Ladybug while you are milking? So Kay will put grain into her trough and she'll put, right now she's putting alfalfa cubes that she kind of breaks up a little bit so Ladybug can get them easy. Uh, Ladybug likes a little bit of grain. We every day give our cow a little bit of grain. Well, we could talk about that in an entire video. Uh, Ladybug is a beautiful cow. You look at her condition, you look at her coat. She's a beauty and the reason partially why is because she's a dairy cow and we give her some grain to help keep her condition up and keep her healthy. So that's what's in the trough. Saktiv, uh, not the only person to ask this this week, talked about dealing with worms in your manure and your compost. So if you have worms in your animals and they're pooping out the eggs into that manure and then you're turning that into compost and spreading it all over your field, are you spreading the worm load? If you spread, if you put manure onto a field, yeah, you're spreading the worm eggs. And just like, you know, tossing it out there, you're not gonna kill any worm eggs, you know, throwing it out into the field. If you do a hot compost, hot compost can kill pathogens and it can kill all that stuff. Uh, so you know, do some research into hot compost if you're looking to kill that. Uh, also, you can age it so that the worm hatches, larvae crawls up, it, it can't live forever just sitting out there without a host, dies, break the cycle. So if you're using manure to eventually be composted or spread onto your property, aging it and doing like a hot compost is a good way to help keep the worm load low in your compost. Next question. An old boy scout wants to know, how do you find time and what do you do for income for the homestead? Old boy scout, my primary business right now is content creation. I am a podcast and video creator and I have monetized my podcasts and videos, my content in multiple ways, including YouTube, which I get paid probably about a third of my 
uh, actual income comes from YouTube advertisements that are played on our videos. It's not the only way. We also make money through our Pioneer program, which as you regular viewers know, uh, the Pioneer program, it is five bucks a month. It gets you access to bonus classes that I used to teach at schools. There's a food preservation class that's taught by a culinary instructor. Um, there's classes on starting an orchard for those of you looking to start a half acre, perfect half acre homestead suburban. There's bonus content podcasts. There's like 20 bonus podcast episodes you can download with one click. Boom, now they're on your phone and you enjoy 20 more drives into work with bonus content uh, podcasts. There are discounts. If you are starting an orchard, Dave from Northeast Edible gives a 10% discount on all your trees. That will pay for your homesteading membership like that because uh, trees can add up if you buy a bunch of them. And Dave from Northeast Edible ships. So. You guys, become a pioneer, plant an orchard, and you get your money back right there. So it's kind of a win-win. That is the biggest way I earn my income. Home City Pioneers have ensured this show can keep going. And if you love this show and you want to make sure we don't go anywhere, there's a link below. You can become a Home Steady Pioneer, $5 a month, or scroll down when you're purchasing to the $50 for the year option, you get two months for free by doing it that way. That's the and then am study. Those are the three ways I make most of my money, uh, and that's the only ways I make money right now. So we are 100% full-time content creators, and that has allowed me to do on my homestead, find the time on my homestead. When I had a job, I could do much less content, and I could do less on the homestead because I had to leave every day. But it's not impossible. If you have a job and you're trying to find the time to homestead, the best thing you can do, wake up an extra hour earlier in the morning, spend that hour doing your daily chores, keep the homestead to really a half hour's work every day because when things go wrong, you'll need the full hour and you don't want to be showing up to work late. So build a homestead that works with your lifestyle, wake up a little bit earlier. That's what I did for like three or four years. That chicken is noisy now. Now the dogs are sleeping and the chicken's noisy. And, uh, you know, focus on animals and things on your homestead projects that you can do a little bit of daily maintenance and then like on the weekend do more. So, you know, egg laying chickens, you can load them up with feed and water. You can give them feed and water for a week in their coop. And every day just like open the door, count, make sure they're all alive, and off you go to work, come home in the evening, Watch them all go in the coop, close it up. That can take you like 10 minutes a day. And then on the weekend, you clean out your coop and you, you know, have fun with your chickens and you enjoy it more. So just pick things that work. Uh, a milk cow is probably not the best bet for someone with a full-time job because every day it's like half hour, 45 minutes in the morning, milking your cow, plus more time in the evening. You know, there are definitely things that are better for people with a full-time job. Chickens are a great one. Gardens are okay, especially if you go with like low weed maintenance gardens. Jennifer wants to know just how loud are your goats? Because she wants to get two to three backyard goats to take care of her overwhelming growth of blackberries. Do they sleep quietly through the night? She's worried about violating the noise ordinance. She's going to ask her city for approval. Whoa, Jennifer. Don't ask your city for approval. Uh-uh. Without asking them, go and find the city ordinances. You'll find them online or down at the town hall in a book. Worst case scenario, you can't find them, just ask someone, where do I look to find ordinances about livestock? <laughs> then read. And if you find nothing that says you can't have goats, don't ask permission. City officials love to say no. That's why they became city officials. They're people who like to say no to people. They like to have a little bit of power. And when, you know, homesteaders come in and say, oh, please, sir, I'd like some more goats. They're like, no, ooh, endorphin boost. I love saying no to people who want to produce their own food and enjoy life outside, caring for livestock and helping other people and making the world a better place. Ooh, I love squishing them. Don't ever ask the city for permission unless you then see, okay, it is clear in the city ordinances I can't. Then, if you want to go and try to make a case for it, sure, by all means, try to 
change their mind. If you have really cool city people and maybe you got a little in and you get some farm fresh eggs to the right guy, you know, then maybe you can make some things happen. You can get goats that are quiet. I have owned goats that made hardly a peep. But you just gotta make sure the goats you shop for are quiet goats. Make that priority number one. They'll all eat your blackberries, only some of them will do that quietly. So some breeds are known to be a bit more quieter, but generally, we always say here, more important than breeds is lines. So uh, my La Manchas have always been pretty quiet. They're super annoying in other ways, but the ones I owned, but they were always pretty quiet, didn't make much of a peep. Uh, we had some of the smaller Nigerians who were dead quiet. We had some that would scream at you. As you know, my Nubians are quite loud. The, oh, you can check out Olber Hossies. So just find a line, a breeder with some, and then say to them, hey, I can't have loud goats. As far as are they noisy at night, no. Goats at night are, I've never, even my noisy goats are never loud at night. They're only loud if at night if something's wrong or like you walk by them at night. But if you don't walk by them, they're just gonna be kind of chilling overnight. So you should be okay. If your city doesn't specifically say no, you go ahead and you get those goats. Don't ask permission. Just make sure it's okay first. And if it's not, then sure, try that get them to, to change your mind because you could totally do it and they wouldn't bother anybody and if they say no to that just find an animal that you know kind of slips through the cracks because I hate 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 when cities say no to livestock it's so stupid they say no to chickens because roosters are noisy then don't have a rooster okay if, if we don't want to I understand it's nice to have a certain level of peace and if people don't want to hear rooster crowing at 5 a.m., I get that. Make it a noise thing, like you can't have loud animals. Okay, you can make that a rule. But, but don't tell people they can't have any chickens. My hens make next to no noise, except for that one that was like clucking. But nobody hears that. And goats, you know, you can have quiet goats. Pigs, pigs don't have to be stinky. You could have a, you know, it gets me so annoyed when Cities make these blanket rules that you can't have a thing because a couple of people don't like the noise of a chicken. It's just, yeah, don't get me started on city officials. There's a reason why I am not in the business that my dad is. I learned that business, excavation. We worked in septic systems for years. It's a great way to make a good income. It's a nice, honest living. My, my dad's got a great business I could have taken over. I couldn't stand dealing with city officials. Don't get me wrong, there were one or two of them we would work with that were nice. And if you're one of them watching and you're like, hey, dude, easy, I'm a city official, but I'm really cool. They, there are really nice ones out there. One of my good friends back home was a city official and he was a very great guy. But a lot of them are not. A lot of them love to say no and love to just like squash dreams. They get a little bit of power because the city backs them and it's like they become the god of noisy livestock maintenance. And what a ridiculous thing. So, yeah, I could talk for the rest of this episode, which should be almost over because this is getting pretty long. Michael wants to know the best setup for a brooder slash coop. They're going to get chicks. Uh, should they be separate, moving chicks to the coop as they grow up a bit or all in one? Uh, Michael, I really suggest you have a separate setup for a brooder and a coop because next year you're going to need both. Now, if you don't have any chickens now and you want to get one coop and make that your brooder for the year, go for it. But your brooder could be indoors. When they're really small, you take a little kitty pool, you throw a heat lamp over it, and make sure it's safe. Heat lamps can cause fires. Uh, there's other products from like Premier One that are a lot safer if you're going to put it in your house. So check those out. Um, but your brooder just needs to be a warm space and when chickens are small, they can't really fly. You can put them inside and some rubber maids, something simple. We have videos of our brooding setups over the years you can find on our channel and uh, they're, they're, yeah, pretty simple. But do have a separate one because as your chickens get older, you can't put chicks in the coop with the older chickens. You're gonna wanna brood more next year. Uh, so get a coop that's separate from your brooder. Uh, keep the brooder simple, don't go crazy with anything fancy, and then just have a nice chicken coop that keeps everybody safe. Brooke E. asks about consistency with a new family milk cow, and just so happens that as I'm doing this, Kay is walking around the barn, so she'll probably hear what I'm saying and correct me at some point. Uh, Brooke, 
She's getting a Jersey cow in two weeks, wondering if there are any tips for getting her settled in. Also wondering how consistent I need to be in milk times. When I milk her, do I always need to milk 12 hours apart? Trying to figure out a schedule for her family that she can do easily. Can I milk her at 8 a.m. and 5 p.m.? Thanks in advance. Brooke, a lot of that's gonna depend on your cow, your cow's production. If this cow is been in a commercial dairy for her whole life and she's producing at that 12 hour interval and she's a high producer, yeah, you're probably gonna wanna keep her real rigid and real steady. Now our cow, Ladybug, is not a high producer, extremely flexible. We one day could milk at 10 a.m., the next day we could milk at 11, the next day we could milk at nine. Uh, it's much more flexible, she's a lower producer, and we're calf sharing, so that makes life so much easier. I really suggest calf sharing uh, to someone who doesn't have a high producing cow. Uh, a lot of times you gotta, you gotta pick that though before you buy the cow. You gotta really select for a cow that will be a good option for calf sharing. Um, so a lot will depend on your cow and her production. Now, they can adjust their production to the need as the calf, obviously as the calf gets weaned, they, they slow production naturally. Uh, so they can adjust to what you're taking as well. And if you work with your cow to get her onto your routine, uh, a cow may be able to make that change. My wife is listening, making sure it's all accurate. You have anything to add to this? As far as getting her settled in uh, with Ladybug, we just had a good solid area that she couldn't escape from for the first couple weeks. Small paddock because she might not be used to you and she might want to run away from you at first. Uh, so something small where you can really keep her controlled. Don't get her out on 100 acres of pasture and just let her go first thing because then you'll be doing like a lasso rodeo. And um, you know, establish a good routine. Establish a good routine. Two words, playing uh, charades here. Brush, brush, brush her. Second word, <laughs> I can't say on camera. So yeah, hope that helps. Lynn Smith wants to know, they're gonna fence in a goat area. Do we use the electric white tape and strands with our goats? Yeah, we have. It, a lot of that depends on the goat. Can it jump over the fence? Uh, will it barge through the fence? Does it have more hair so it's a little more insulated? We have goats that respect electric. We've had goats that like jumped over it and messed with it. So that's one of those, it will depend on your goat. But by all means, it can work for you. Just make sure with the goat you have more strands and it's high. Otherwise, you're gonna be asking for problems. But you bought a goat, so you were already asking for problems. Say hello. Hi. You gonna answer a question? Uh, was there a good question for me to answer? You missed them all, all, all the right, cow good. questions. Uh, a lot of people had questions about the AI. We'll do a video next week. Yeah, so if you have any further questions on the AI, you can leave it in the comments below. And we'll get, get to them, to if you it. wanna know about that baby daddy. George or Jorge, probably Jorge, wants to know, will I be hunting with another weapon other than a sniper? Sniper is not a kind of, there, there's, you can't buy like a sniper rifle. It's just the rifle that the person called a sniper would use. It would be a rifle that is designed for long distance shooting. I have a rifle that is designed for long distance shooting. I am not a sniper, so it's not a sniper rifle. I am a guy who is okay at hunting, or okay at shooting. I'm not a sniper. So I will definitely be hunting with something other than a sniper. I do bow hunt. And you will see in upcoming videos, I got my bow tuned and I've been sh practicing. We'll do some videos showing b archery and bow and arrows. I predominantly bow hunt because gun season is only like a couple weeks here. So it'll be mostly archery hunting that you see with a little bit of wanting to but not actually being a sniper. Tim wants to know if we've searched the property for food we can forage. Tim, last week we found a chicken of the woods mushroom but it was a little gone. It was like full of caterpillars and yeah. Uh, we've also found some raspberry bushes, a lot of the property. We will do a video where we walk around and show some of that stuff. It's a great idea. Don't know when, but maybe once we find enough. That, that's a really good video idea, so stay tuned for that. Thanks for the idea. Crayhack asks if the German Shepherd on the property acts as an LGD. Does he live with the animals? Oh, the wind blew the door shut to the barn. 
I've uh, never seen them use as LGDs because of their herding instincts. That's We talked about that a little earlier, Crayhack. You're exactly right. A German Shepherd is herding, it's nipping. That would not be a great LGD option. No, this German Shepherd is not an LGD. He is a people GD. Or a cat GD. Or a cat GD? Hmm. He like he chases them off too. He wants them to be where he wants the cats to be where they belong. So yeah, he's just um, security and companionship for people, not for animals. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> I said nope so many times because I would not trust him in the barn at all. I wouldn't trust most of these dogs in the barn. Oh, these two are great. Not well, no, that not one. that one. No, she would be the. I'm talking about you. He, I would trust in the barn. Yes. He would be great. He's but so, he look at how anything. majestic he is. Well, you saw enough of him. <laughs> I had to show them because they were making so much noise. Oh. Whiskey Bent Farms. When ordering on Amazon, I use my app. Is there a way to support you that way? I actually don't know and I was gonna research it and then I forgot to whiskey. So, I don't, no, I don't know. This is, I don't even know why I brought this onto this channel. What have I done? I'll look into it, Whiskey. I'll try to find an answer for you, along with all those .cas and .uks. Vanessa wants to know what kind of animals will we hunt this season? Definitely, this upcoming season will be deer. In Pennsylvania, you can also hunt bear and turkey in the fall. And if you're wondering if I would hunt bear, I don't know. Not because I have anything against hunting bears, but um, because bears are scary. And if I did hunt bear, I would absolutely be eating that bear because bear is supposed to actually be really good if you don't get a garbage eating bear. And around here there would not be garbage eating bears, they would be wild eating bears. So yes, you can hunt bears, not sure that I will. Uh, turkey, yeah. I've been trying to get a turkey for like nine years and I've got no turkey. So you guys can expect to see deer and I do like hunting birds as well with my dogs. So there'll be some bird hunting too. Uh, not turkey with the dogs though. That I don't think is legal in Pennsylvania. It is back in Connecticut. Uh, but I don't think you can run dogs and turkeys here. I tried, I tried so hard to get through all this last week. There are so many questions. I can no longer promise you that I'm going to get to your question. But if you want me to get to your question, hashtag it, ask Homesteady, and I will try very hard to get to as many as I can in our weekly show. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you for your support, whether it's through becoming a pioneer or uh, using Amsteady when you shop on Amazon or just watching all our videos and letting that ad play so we get the ad money from YouTube. Whatever way you do, sharing our videos, it's a huge support. Make sure to stay tuned. Next week we're going to have some really good videos. We should have finally our fly spray video out. We should have uh, the worm treatment video with our special guest. That got delayed because of ladybugs coming into heat but that's coming too, and some other fun stuff. So we'll see you in next week's videos, and uh, I'm gonna go now. I got some stuff to do on the farm, get some farm work done.